Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the United District podcast. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a former Norwegian international, former striker and current football journalist Jan Arga Fjortoft. Jan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, thanks for having me. No, it's great to have you on and obviously I know you're a very busy man at the minute with uh, everything going on. The transfer window is is well and truly underway. Uh, the season, the Premier League season at least, is over. The European competitions are still going. It's quite a, a hectic time for football with everything that's gone on. And um, yeah, I, I thank you for taking time out of your day to come on there. I know you're, a, as I say, a, a busy man. Um, we'll, we'll dive straight into things. Um, I think we've got to ask first about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, a man you know well, uh, a fellow Norwegian footballer. Um, it's, he's just completed his first full season as United manager in the Premier League at least, still got the Europa League to play. It feels like it's been the longest season of all time, p- perhaps because it has, um, but it is his, only his first full season as permanent manager. How do you think he's fared? I know obviously we've got the Europa League yet to play and that can filter into things, but but how do you think Solskjaer's got on in general in his first full season? Well, first of all, I must say that uh, I'm, I'm a hectic day, but I was that's just because I'm running my own communication company. But then I try to be uh, in the stories and the transfer that I know something about mm. that is val- valuable to, to report that I'm getting involved. Uh, so it's, it's, it's always great to talk about the big transfers and, and especially between the two countries that I love most football wise is Norway and uh, sorry, England and in Germany. Mm. Uh, so that's been said. Uh, now, of course, uh, us Norwegians, we are very proud. We are a small country of five million uh, people. And uh, first of all, in the, in, the, in the 90s, we had a, well, at, at the best, 25, 30 Norwegians play, playing in the Premiership. Mm. Uh, I was one of the first when I came over in 93. We had some like uh, uh, Erik Torstved, Gunnar Halle, Stig Inge Björneby, some of them mm. uh, well known to the, to the English fans. But... Uh, but imagine at a time when when uh, Manchester United won the treble, we had Ronnie Johnson, Henningberg, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, mm. and even another one who uh, was at Manchester United in the 90s, a, a guy called Eric Nevelan. Mm. But uh, but at, le- at least we had three in that uh, winning year, which was unbelievable. Made us all very proud, and, and uh, yeah, I. I was fortunate to play in England too, not with big clubs like Manchester United, but fortunate to play in clubs where when they were in the Premiership. And yeah. but we saw we saw the way uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer conducted himself, how he adjusted, how he learned from his position to be. When I grew up, there was a guy called David Fairclough who was uh, playing for Liverpool, and they called him the super sub. Those were mm. the days when, when, when they had one, one reserve, uh, one, <clears throat> one on the sub bench. And Ole Gunnar turned into a, a super sub. Uh, but not only did he do that, I mean, if you, if you read, his, read his stats, he, always, he also played the many game for Manchester United, also in the starting eleven. But yeah. he had a fantastic goal-scoring record. And you always felt that Ole Gunnar was one of the um, players, one of the human beings in that uh, environment that that understood the Manchester United DNA mm. uh, and you always I'm not saying that I, I, knew, I knew it would be a coach I knew that it would be a coach but how good it would be that that is very hard to say but you always understand when people kind of follow uh, a, a great leader like Sir Alex Ferguson and, and the likes of big managers if you're if you're a bit clever if you're intelligent if you systematize you you get into the system all the things that is said and done in the in the training on the training ground. Mm. You always feel like Ole Gunnar could go all the way, and and now being a manager for Manchester United, we have to say that he's gone all the way. Mm. And I must say that you did make that that fantastic prediction that that tweet that I'm sure a lot of our listeners are aware of that that prediction that you made. So obviously you had that feeling that he was gonna 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 get this job and, and go all the way. And I must say, yeah, credit to you for that as well. Yeah, I, I just want to say that, say that because that was in 2014 yeah. when I predicted that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer would be the Manchester United manager. That was based on the history of football. I'm 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 very. I love my history. I love my history being in politics or being in sport. But yeah, yeah. you saw that the big clubs there were there was more or less the same pattern uh, with a with a great manager staying there for many years, and then you like to to get a copy in uh, as as close as you get to the ideas of the master himself. That being David Moyes, mm. uh, and then the, always the next one is then you just say now. 
just we don't care we we need the most famous we need a famous manager yeah, yeah. we just need a famous one that was for you guys fangal mm. uh, and then after that didn't like 100% succeed based on the the great achievements of sir alex ferguson and and his team then you will look for the guy just get a, the one who will win us trophies and that was jose mourinho mm. and at the end of the day when that doesn't work like 100% it can be said that mourinho won uh, titles but mm. but still the camp wasn't um, as you, know, you hoped then you will always look for a former pupil of the big master himself and that is a lot about timing and uh, there were times when Steve Bruce was linked to the job Brian Robson yeah, Mark yeah. Hughes and so on but at that time timings wise there was uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and uh, so so that was um I must say that was a good prediction. I have to give you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was, and I think a lot of our, our listeners will will agree with that. Just going back on to Solskjaer, you know, you mentioned he was obviously that is what he was known for, wasn't it? The baby face assassin off of the bench, making an impact um, f- from there, and that's, that's sort of the iconic aspect of his career. As you say, he did start a lot of games as well. But do you think the time spent on the bench helped mould who he is today? Sort of sitting alongside Alex Ferguson, watching the games from that perspective, being close to the coaching staff. Do you, do you think that helped him in, in in the future with his managerial career? Yeah, I think there's a personality of Ole Gunnar was that kind of guy that he was reading the game. He loved loved his football game, uh, and he had, he had the intelligence to follow that uh, skill, so to say. And 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 I, I I've seen many interviews where Ole Gunnar said that when his teammates were kind of joking around at the bench he was looking for for weaknesses mm. possibilities if he got on uh, and building up that reputation it was harder and harder because people knew that when Ole Gunnar came on there was always a chance that he would get a goal that being said I think that molded him to be the personality and the skill and the ability that he later could use as a coach but it also got to be say that, said that Ole Gunnar was a great, great finisher. Uh, he came; he's a bit younger than me, uh, so but he came on to the to the national team when when I was on my way out. I was mm-hmm. older. I was uh, one of the seniors in the national team, and we always had these competitions. Uh, we love them doing finishing, who scored most volleys yeah, yeah. and shots. And Ole Gunnar had a fantastic uh, goal ratio also in training and. And he had at that time. I remember I thought about it that Ole Gunnar had that. There was a player called Romario, a big Brazilian, and he was he was one of those guys. Ole Gunnar, when when he kind of he was uh, like wo- uh, running with the ball, and suddenly had he shot. You just you didn't see anything signals that he he was going to shoot, yeah. but he did. That. So that 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 ability to uh, doing the finishing that was also excellent. Uh, and uh, you can see on his stats that uh, that helped him throughout his career. Mm. Um, you were speaking there about you know the, the managers that, that United, have, <clears throat> excuse me, have, have gone through. Uh, you know, as you say, since Ferguson, you know, an array of different managers going for different approaches. Um, and, and as of recent, I think appointing former players has become quite a big thing especially for, for the biggest clubs you know Mikel Arteta is, is now at Arsenal you, Frank Lampard has got himself at Chelsea and then most recently obviously Perlo now at Juventus what, what do you think about that approach from clubs and do you think it's something we're going to continue seeing from the top clubs I think that when people sign managers it's very underestimated thing which manager you come after put it Manchester United I, I was in Sevilla at one of the last games of Mourinho maybe the last one I can't remember. It was one of the last, mm. and I remember that the the atmosphere in the camp was it was terrible to be honest. It was like uh, you you felt there was something wrong in that dressing room, and and when you then need a manager after Mourinho, you will you will look for for a guy that could uh, boost the confidence, the inspiration, the the mood of the camp. So Laguna was uh, then taken in and had a fantastic start and. Of course, the key game being in Paris when they when I knocked out PSG. Uh, so sometimes you know, there are timing is a lot to do with it, but also I'm not saying that it go into fashion, but it's it's a way when one club like Manchester United will get uh, Solskjaer, mm. then then it's easier for for Arsenal to get Arteta. Having said that, he was one of the candidates. Then it, there wasn't time. Then it got Emery in, and then mm. a new the next one could be Arteta. Frank Lampard was always destined to 
to go there. But then again, it's all about timing. And now, as you said, with now Pirlo, after a Sarri that maybe didn't kind of um, mirror what uh, the old lady wanted to have in their club, they want this elegance, they want uh, the, the Italian, they want the owners, Agnelli, they, they want all these kind of things yeah. in, into their club. So at the moment now, people, CEOs and boards and, and, and chairmen and owners, they will say, well, if they can do it, maybe we can do it as well. But there is another one a, a thing that they have in common. is not only that they are former players. Both Arteta, Lampard and, and Solskjaer, they were players with great attitude. Mm. They were uh, based on footballers' levels, intelligent players. They were players all their career that tried to learn from the, from the great managers they, they've had. So it's not only the former player thing, it's uh, it's also the abilities, the intelligence these players have to adjust, uh, and and then the last point would being that they are, there is a kind of generation thing now when when the Harry Redknapp's Big Sam kind of managers sometimes some at, at, for some time mm. not getting older, then you have to start all over again. They've done the same thing in Germany, uh, mm. and now it's the England England to turn to to. to take it from a, from from an, another uh, generation of football players yeah yeah fair enough and, and as we say there you know the three main ones in england of that example you know lampard arteta and solskjaer all perceived to have succeeded this season really arteta getting a trophy chelsea getting top four and us finishing third obviously we're happy with third for now but um liverpool and city are still away off points wise and you'd think ability wise really as well what, what do you think united need in order to to bridge that gap between uh you know us and and city and liverpool well first of all uh, manchester city and liverpool uh, they are amazing the two last seasons <laughs> the the amount of points the the space between them and the rest of the lot and what liverpool have done this season is is um, unbelievable i mean it's a long long season but we should never reduce the the thing they've done this season I mean, to to win Maybe the hardest league in the world with with that amount of points is is unbelievable. But as you said, Manchester United won't be happy with with being was it thirty three points behind uh, Liverpool Football Club. Mm. That that United that is nothing they can live with, and that that is the pressure, that is the possibility, that is the challenge for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Yes, he needs to win trophies. Maybe in in an, in a week or so he won a trophy. That's fine. But the, the daily bread is, is the Premier League. And, and he got to get closer there. He knows that. Then you have to get players in that. I think it's fair to say that, that Ole Gunnar now got more of the team that he can call his team. Yeah. You saw, you saw how massive and how uh, important it is to get his kind of players in. Bruno Fernandes. I mean, there's not a coincidence that they're, they're going forward started with him a great player a balanced player he, he needs to get Paul Pogba going again to to when he is at his best he is a he is an asset to to any football club and you need to get him going again mm-hmm. you feel that the, also the club uh, have uh, in Rashford Martial Greenwood they got they got great players going forward but I think that uh, they, they try now to get Sancho I think that is is the right thing to do because I think, yes, a green would excite people, uh, but Sancho for for Manchester United would be a great great asset to get in mm. because that he, he all, with his ability to score goals, uh, uh, create goals that he's doing for fun, but and then I also feel that uh, Manchester United uh, need a, a centre half, another extra centre half. I'm not. I don't think they are quite good enough uh, well Maguire is good at being Maguire Lindelof is doing okay but mm. I think you need you need one more being at the goalkeeping position being a former Sheffield United uh, uh, striker yeah. I, I, I will happy that he will stay there so we'll see how, how De Gea will, will start the ne- new season we know that De Gea at his best is brilliant so, so you need three or four more players I think to get closer uh, but still the main thing is also to get going that form you had uh, after Corona. What did you what you had in 
in 2020. And and Ole Gunnar knows knows that, but he also knows that as he getting closer, <coughs> his team, it's easier also to evaluate his uh, ability as a manager. Now you get him into Champions League was great. Uh, yeah. That gives a good uh, uh, good good platform for next season, and then you just have to take it from there. Mm. Moving on to a man you've just mentioned. You mentioned him, Jan, not me. You brought him up first. It's, uh, it's the man on everyone's uh, tongues at the minute. It's, that's um, that's James Sancho. Obviously, a deal that's that's. It seems yearly United have a deal that drags out across the summer. Last year we had Harry Maguire, and you know there was sagas with um, Paulo Dybala as well. Um, and years before that, you know, many other names. It's obviously this year it's Sancho. The deal's taken a while. United fans, as you know, are desperately hungry for information, uh, constant information on Jaden Sancho. Um, what is the current hold-up on the deal, for, do, do, do you think? What is the current hold-up and why, why is this deal taking so long to, to, to complete? Well, I tried to, I tried to say the back, background first because I think there's a mixture for Manchester United fans that you're getting frustrated when when Manchester City just sign a player mm. uh, or Liverpool just signing a player. H- having said that, I think that is a part also for Manchester United being the global brand. It's a, it's a compliment to Manchester United that all new players have an extra interest uh, in and around the world. And it takes time. I think it's also a fact that you don't have a, a person, that you don't have a department between the manager and the CEO. I think that slows th- things a bit down. Uh, but the Sancho thing that I think keep on frustrating the Manchester United fans are there are so many different views of what's going on. Yeah. And yeah. to understand that, you have to understand the difference between how this the current situation is seen in Germany and in England. Mm-hmm. And uh, first of all, you have to try to think of yourself that you were supposed to sell Greenwood. And Ole Gunnar mm. Solskjaer said the 10th of August, well, if he flies with us in training camp, Greenwood would stay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's what Sork has done with Sancho. He's been very open from the, from earlier this year that if uh, if if Sancho should go, he should go for 120 million euro. That's point number one. Point number two, the deal got to be sorted before 10th. Of August when we go to Switzerland for training camp. The problem Sork got is that he has said that before. He said that about Dembele. Mm. He said that by Abu Mayang. And one went to Barcelona, one went to, to Arsenal. So you got to understand that also that the English see Sork's statements a bit differently. Yeah. And in England, in, in Germany, uh, he's praised Sork for being strong and clear. In uh, England, uh, he's seen as one who has played one card in the poker game, mm. which make it a bit frustrating for the fans to follow it. Yeah, uh, I speak. I try to speak to both sides. Uh, I try to to uh, read every German outlet uh, or any G- German media. Uh, I try to follow. And I speak with people in and around the club, uh, and you can see that they are getting frustrated that somehow Manchester United feel they can just grab their players. Yeah, yeah. That, and I think that is, it's fair to say yeah. that that has been uh, the case because Manchester United, they got to take from Dortmund the, the best player they've got at the moment. And I, and I included the Norwegian Erling Haaland. And I followed, I followed, I saw the 10 or 12 first game in 2020 by Dortmund. I saw them both live and I, I was so impressed by, by Sancho. What mm. a player. What a player taking on people. Involved in more or less everything Dortmund did. Uh, but they're going to lose that player. So we have to understand that there is a mental thing to this as well. Uh, that Manchester United are taking the best player of Dortmund. A Dortmund team who is second in Bundesliga. A Dortmund team that have uh, ambitions in the Champions League. So for them to lose Sancho, if that is the end to this, it's it's very painful for them. And I think that sometimes, when you when you read the English media, when more or less, uh, I guess some some of the information they have is also based on when they talk to to people in and around Manchester United, you just feel that they can just go there and take Sancho. That's mm. not how 
things work, this is a, this could gonna gonna be the biggest deal in this transfer window. A transfer window that nobody knows how it will develop. Yeah, yeah. Because because when Dortmund put 120 million price tag on Sancho, he was put on there in a time where we didn't, we haven't heard of a corona. So for Dortmund, that is the weakness of the strategy of, of Dortmund. Is that Dortmund thought they will have Barcelona on, Real Madrid on, maybe PSG on, <laughs> maybe another English club on Sancho. Yeah. And now they find themselves in a position that if Sancho is going to leave Dortmund, he will go to Manchester United. And so that is where the strategy of Dortmund is uh, struggling a bit at the moment. Plus that Sork has put deadlines before and Manchester United feel that they they have a chance on the player. We are told that the personal terms are agreed. We have been told that Sancho wants to play for Manchester United. But we also see that the dialogue between Dortmund and the player and the camp of the players so far seem very good. But I also noticed that I put in a tweet today, I also noticed that everybody else is t- telling us that they're happy that Sancho is staying in Dortmund. I have not heard Sancho say that. Mm. So I think that is a big challenge for Dortmund now. How are they going to do that? And if they do it, you know what English media will say? The English media will say, well, he was pressurized to say that and the deadline is still 5th yeah. of October. So it's a big challenge for Dortmund now in, in terms of strategy, how are they going to do it? Mm. Do you expect to see that from Sancho? Do you think Sancho is going to be forced to, to, to making a statement on it all and coming out himself and clearing things up? There is nothing that I, I, I know Dortmund quite well. There is, there is nothing, uh, there nothing in, the, in, in, in uh, the management of Dortmund that will kind of force any player. They yeah. try now to play their cards as good as they can. They try to, uh, on, on one hand, keep a player. And secondly, they know, they tried that before to force players to stay. And that didn't succeed. So they, they, uh, they try now, I'm not saying a different strategy, but they are trying the strategy to have a good dialogue with Sancho. Sancho, I've been told, has been great in training. He's been in a fantastic mood, uh, which can mean a lot of things. can mean that the dialogue with Dortmund is that if someone gets the 120 million euro, he will go, maybe... Maybe he's happy to get home, or maybe he is, like Dortmund is saying, is staying. And uh, so there is there is no signal yet that Sancho will will force a move. There is no signal yet that Dortmund will say, tell the media this and be hundred percent clear on that. Uh, and I think that is a balance between uh, forcing, wanting, hoping. And I think yeah. that is a. Uh, Dortmund got to find the, the same mixture there. I, the communication department of Dortmund, they are good guys. Uh, so is the, the rest of the, the head of sports there. So I can't see them forcing him to do anything. They know if, they, if they're forcing the player, he will probably leave. Mm. What did you think? You sort of, sort of touched on it already. What did you think of those, that, those mass statements from the Dortmund players? Do you think that's a... Do you think that's a negotiating tactic? Do you think that's them putting pressure on United, all the players coming out and, and saying th- things uh, like they seem assured, don't they, the players, or at least they've, been, they've sort of seen that way, that they're assured that Sancho's staying. Do you think that's a, a tactic that's been instigated from Dortmund's side? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that uh, you would be surprised how little uh, other players know about anyone's contract, anyone's situation. Right. At least they saw their um, head of sport, Sork, say that he will stay they are asked are you happy for, of course they're happy they will they, right. are, they have been told that he's he's one of their best player but of course that it's a it's a challenge and it's a it's a, a kind of a code for them to break now how are they gonna today it was the sport director uh, sebastian kell who said we're happy that he's staying fantastic but it's more or less coming more and more a bit funny that the only one who hasn't said that to Dortmund is Sancho. Yeah, uh, uh, I've talked to them about that, uh, and of course they also see that as a as a, is a way how we're going to solve it. You you must know that Sancho hasn't done a lot of individual stuff uh, the last year uh, for yeah. different reasons. I guess because he's uh, he got the same pressure from German media and English media. So I think that is one of the reasons that he's kind of done that after games. He had a chance yesterday. 
uh, after the friendly and he said, I'm happy with the boys. I'm happy to be a leader here. I'm happy to help them into the team. But they know it. We know it. Everybody work with communication. That is not enough to kind of stop the speculations. And mm. going through all the English media today, uh, it hasn't. Uh, I think they hope, or I will say they prayed that it would. But I think that this is, um, this is a thing that Dortmund got to solve. It's going to be interesting to see how they're going to do it. Yeah, you say you don't think Sancho will sort of agitate for the move or put a transfer request in or something along those lines. Do you think that needs to happen in order for a move to happen? Or do you think this deal can still go smoothly without Sancho intervening and, and demanding a transfer? Well, for the first... Well, we, we've heard that the, you can get a player for 120 million euros, so it's quite easy for Manchester United to get him. So if, 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 if they want him, they know that if they pay 120, they would have got him. Mm. So that they got him. That is point one. But we don't know. I love, I always used uh, the, the example of Cristiano Ronaldo when he stayed at Manchester United for another year. Mm. And there was quite an understanding. I remember I said that I worked in TV at that time. When he stayed, uh, I said, uh, uh, I think they will done a deal uh, that if you do well for us this season, Real Madrid will be back for you in one year. Just give us a great season, which Cristiano Ronaldo did. So if there, is a, if there is an understanding, and there has been an understanding with Sancho and Dortmund, that if you do well for us in summer, we will let you go. Mm. Uh, but just, just look after yourself, be a good, good guy, have the great attitude, do, do, do your stuff, and then we'll find a way that you can go back home. Because that is a point as well. He is an Englishman in Germany. Mm. So this is a bit differently. And... So if that dialogue has been good, if that has been a promise to the player and he can see that Dortmund has done everything they can to, to, uh, to agree with, with Manchester United, probably there won't be anything like that. If him, he and his camp feel that Manchester United came in and said, say, 100 million euros, it's, it's not a bad uh, transfer fee <laughs> uh, either, is it? Mm. Uh, and he feels that, well, that is so close, you have to let me go now and he didn't. He, he, don't, he doesn't feel that uh, there was enough will from his club, Dortmund, uh, then he could maybe take the next move. But we don't know that because uh, Manchester United, in their world, the deadline is 5th of October and in Dortmund, it's 10th of August. Mm. But I think that is important for Manchester United. I'm not saying this uh, on being on one or another side, but if nothing happened, Sancho will stay in Germany. So... So it's Manchester United who want this player. It's Manchester United who have to fulfill Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's biggest wish is to get Sancho, which I understand because it's exactly that kind of global player, that kind of player that will excite Old Trafford, will excite the Manchester United fans that mm. remember uh, the Giggs and Beckham and the Beckhams and the Cantonas. Yeah. Uh, I think everyone's been sort of caught up in the frenzy of everything. Not many people have actually sat back and, and spoke about Sancho as a player. It's all been talk of fees and money and this and that. How much better do you think Jane Sancho makes Manchester United? Well, I think I, I grew up, I was a, I was in England in the 90s. I played against that fantastic uh, class of 92, Cantona, Michael Hughes kind mm. of team. And, and I think I remember... Even when I played against them, I, I was excited in the way they had so many different players that excited uh, the football world. And I think that that has been a bit a lack of Manchester United the last years. They, they are getting in some great, great individuals now, especially uh, from the young strikers going forward. But I think that this player, this is, this is the, that kind of player, when he gets the ball, you, you can just feel, feel the crowd. Uh, you can just feel it, that... People now expect something going to happen. He's taking players on for fun. He has, uh, for his uh, young, uh, for his youth or for his age, uh, maturity in in when to do it himself, when to play the other guys in. And if there is one thing I will say about Dortmund is that they they're a very unselfish team. Being Royce, being Holland, being Brandt, being Sancho, uh, being yeah. Hazard. They are a team that, that look for each other. They want to play each other on. They want to... I remember when when Holland got his hat-trick and one of the goals, Hassad and himself went one against one against the goalkeeper and Hassad just gave 
hole and a goal. And he said in an interview, I interviewed afterwards to Hazard, and I said, well, that was my gift to him. Uh, <laughs> and I think that uh, Sancho will give that that to Manchester United. He will also give that flair uh, and excitement that maybe the last uh, Manchester United teams have missed. And it's also the way Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wants to play, that you need this player who, who can quick transform from defend going forward. Uh, then the more players you have, the more you can see that that game plan will, so, will also be more and more the strength of Manchester United. So, so Ole Gunnar, when, when he, sa- he says that I want Sancho, it's not because he will sell more shirts so that will excite the fans. That is just a bonus. Yeah, you have to see on the player, and the best players available to do that at the moment in the whole football world is uh, Jaden Sancho. Mm. Obviously, J- 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 Sancho would be joining that English contingency of strikers alongside uh, Marcus Rashford and Mason Greenwood. As a former striker, I just wanted to ask you your just thoughts on on Mason Greenwood. I think every United fan has been absolutely astonished by the quality of this lad. You know, two footed, unpredictable, clinical in front of goal. What are your views on Greenwood, just as a former striker and someone who who knows the art of scoring goals? Well, first of all, I think that is great for Manchester United that they they get a kid through. Uh, I interviewed Ole Gunnar Solskjaer about him, and he said. And it was just an amazing story about when he met him when he was eight or something. And mm. this is a guy that then ended up being managed by Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And I think that for any striker, I've been fortunate. My first professional contract was in Rapid Vienna in Austria. And uh, the manager was a former great goal getter, a guy called Hans Krankel of his generation, one of the best. Mm. And I know how, how valuable that was for me. And I know how valuable... It is for Greenwood to have a manager that knows his, the, the tricks, who can do some sessions with him. And I'm sure that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will do some extra sessions with him. Like you saying, I love the freshness of him. Uh, although a bit at the end of the season, I was getting a bit tired, which is normal uh, for a long season and, mm. and with all the games and the age. But yeah, he excites me. It's just one of those. I just hope that he can feel. you can feel that freshness you know when he is in and around the 18-yard box, you know that he, he there is a potential that he will score. There is a potential that he he dare to shoot. Uh, you 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 can see from his age that his his head is exactly where his head's gonna be for a for a striker. You he loves scoring goals uh, and <clears throat> and as you saying the the ability to to have <laughs> has hard shots with with both legs is unbelievable. Mm. The, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a neutral. Uh, I love to watch football, and and just then and again, these kind of talents just suddenly occur on the football ground, and you think, wow, it's so great to see them come through. And and I'm sure with Ole Gunnar being the, the striker that he is, he will look after him. Uh, and I'm not, and I don't think it, there's some people saying that why should they go for Sancho when they got to Greenwood. Uh, I see it opposite. I see that in a season where you play 50, 60 games, maybe slowly also being involved with England, you need mm. a broad, broad uh, row of strikers. And that will also give um, uh, Greenwood the chance to stay and be the challenger still. He's still a young kid. Uh, and he got to uh, do some downs to and then come back from there. And then getting even a better player, but this guy got a potential to to be one of the one of the greatest. Mm, it's good to hear that from someone who who knows knows what it's like to be a striker. It's good good to get that reassurance. Obviously, as United fans, we're all massively excited by him. Yeah, I've got one more question. Um, yeah. b- before you go, and then we'll, we'll let you go. I know you're a busy man. Um, with regards to other business, there's a bit of a worry from our fans that we've sort of put our put our eggs in one basket with Sancho, and a bit of a worry that you know there's a couple more positions we'd like to fill in the next couple of windows at least, and, and we haven't really heard much about those. How much business outside of Sancho do you? think Manchester United will do obviously is a very um a, t- a tough uh, tough market to tap into this this time round it is and it's a it's it's a, one of those <clears throat> anyone's guess markets because you don't know how quick you're going to be uh, how will the prices uh, and we know that for example Liverpool have been told they wanted Jurgen Klopp wanted Timo Werner and the owner said we don't have, can't afford him right now and he went to Chelsea 
It looks like Kai Havertz will go to Chelsea as well. So Chelsea is going big time. But I think with Manchester United and a lot of clubs, you have to kind of analyse the comments. Uh, are there anything hidden behind the lines or between the lines, sorry, mm. uh, between uh, when you see that uh, Ole Gunnar is complimented in defenders and maybe Bailly can take another step and so on, then you know, first of all, it's hard to find good centre-halves. That is point one, because there's a lot of clubs like Chelsea, Manchester City, Manchester United, uh, and maybe Liverpool as well, uh, are looking for a replacement for Lovren. They took the, the, the Greek guy now, and maybe that, that is enough for them. But but I think that Manchester United need two or three players. Uh, but you never know, because you need the owners to put money forward. Uh, and if you don't get Sancho, does that mean you can spend those... 100 million not spent on him on different players it's it, again it's all about timing it's all about players available uh, and and then it's also that you start with a plan how you're going to develop your team mm. and the players need to be a consequence of that building plan so yeah. to say so it's not like I remember when Wenger did fantastic he started with how he wanted to play got players in same did Sir Alex Ferguson he wanted a a Roy Keane because he needed that kind of role and and I think that Ole Gunnar will try to do the same he got a he got a way of thinking I don't want only names I want players to fulfill the wishes or or the idea of my adult uh, philosophy of mm-hmm. how I want to play football so uh, so so I think it is it's fair that Manchester United are not uh, linked with with a lot of players I think that is uh, uh, healthy and, but but the thing is with Jadon Sancho, he kind of fits all bills, and I think what, that's what a manager like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer knows. He's English, he's young, yeah. he's quick, he scores goals, assists, and so on. So so that's why I think that's uh, their main target. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Jan, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Uh, thank you for coming on. I don't know if you've got any last words you'd like to say to the listeners. No, I, I think that it's it's quite interesting. First of all, thank you for having me on. It's always interesting to to speak with you, with you guys about the uh, thing that you are so passionate about. I think football is all about passion, mm. uh, all about following your team. And, and now the Twitter is. I remember when I were uh, w- uh, grew up, I had these cards, these football cards, not even glue on. Yeah. I just had had these old cards, and I remember uh, in, in the old days when some of the uh, players moved I was nearly crying when when I didn't like it so <laughs> so I think that the, the fans should be involved and the fans should try to see it from both sides try to see when you analyze something yes we want to play it but why are they doing this and what what can stop that what what is the difference why is Sork saying that okay he can lose his best player what would we do if we lost Greenwood what would we do and so on I think mm-hmm. that is a part of the analysis Having said that, I mean, uh, there is only one thing that people want. They want the best players. They want players to excite them. They want to get, go to, uh, to Old Trafford and see players that they love to watch. And, and, and I understand that. Manchester United, it's, it's, a, it's a hard place to, to, uh, to go in terms of excitement of the players. There was a time when you won everything. And not only that, you did it in a great style with great players. So... Mm. so then, then I understand the, the 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 need not only to get good players in. You want great players. You want people to excite you, and that's why I understand the the great passion and involvement of all the fans to get in a player like Jaden Sancho. Jan, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again for coming on. Cheers. Thank you. We keep in touch.